I'm going to begin by asking, when you were deciding to, to, to step back in, or well, sit back into the director's chair, was the idea, right, let me look for a story now that inspires me, I, I'm ready to go back into it, or did this story come to you and that was what triggered the, the decision to, to go back into directing? The script was really the thing that got me thinking about making another movie. I was really, as far as I was concerned, I was, I was out and I was making television and I was really happy making television. If this script hadn't come along, I, I don't know that I would have gone back to making movies again. But I've learned that you should pay attention you know, when, when you start to, to sort of see signs or you feel like there's a signal that you're, you're picking up on that you should follow that. And so I was, you know, given the script to ostensibly find someone to direct it. And, and it was after a couple of weeks that I realized that, that I really wanted to do it, that I couldn't really, that I was really bothered by the idea of somebody else doing it. And, and even though this is a kind of a territory you, you've sort of stepped into before the kind of heist movie uh, narrative structure, at the same time, it does represent a big challenge because, I mean, this film has got to be comedic, it's got to be poignant, there's got to be suspense. Was that partly why you wanted to get involved as well? Because it felt like it would be quite a difficult um, film to kind of undertake. I guess you wouldn't want to kind of, if you are going to step back in, into directing, I guess you would want something that would really test you as a filmmaker. Well, I always want to be terrified about some aspect of the production. Like, there has to be something that scares me. Um, Certainly, in movies like this, there are, there are a lot of ways in which they can go wrong. And the problem is that when you're, if you're two degrees off, you might as well be 180 degrees off. Like you have to be that precise tonally with what you're doing or you've got a real problem. And so it is on a, on a sort of moment to moment basis and scene by scene, you have to be very, very diligent about the consistency of the universe that everybody's occupying. And um, then, you know, then you get into a place I was talking earlier about how important the music is to these films, or at least it is to me, and how important my relationship with someone like David Holmes is in sort of making sure that this all comes together in the right way. So it's, you have to be diligent. There's no, there's no one thing that you can sort of not be completely on top of or, or it'll just, it'll slip away. I mean, when I think of the sort of classic kind of modern heist movie, that kind of caper, I mean, Ocean's Eleven is the one that, that springs to mind. And I, I think other filmmakers who are kind of um, crafting a story of this nature will probably use that as a real inspiration. But do you look back to that for, for inspiration, can you look back to a project you've directed yourself and go, well, that worked in this, and now I'm going to bring it into this, like other filmmakers might? I, no, I don't look to my own work for inspiration, <laughs> but um, certainly the first Oceans film was a, uh, an important project for me because it required uh, a sort of skill set that I hadn't really employed before and and that I was very nervous about um, it's it's at least in terms of the way I imagined it ought to be done it it it, it needed me to sort of step up my game in terms of just pure staging and shot composition and cutting patterns like I really needed to I really needed to lift it up and sort of think more three-dimensionally than I ever had before. Now, when you add that to the fact that I don't storyboard and that the film was shot completely out of sequence, there were a couple of days on set where, where I was really struggling and sometimes would have to send people away for 20 minutes while I sorted out in my own mind how I wanted to stage something so that it would fit everything else that had been done. So it was... It was funny, it came, you know, that was in the midst of a run of Out of Sight, The Limey, Aaron Brockovich, and Traffic, and then Oceans. And I think there was an assumption that, that like, oh, Traffic, you know, that must have been hard because it was a sort of serious drama. It really wasn't. Like, Oceans was hard. For me, the first Oceans was hard. Like, I, I it was hard. Mm -hmm. Like, I was, I was stressed. And um, the subsequent... Oceans films didn't get any easier. 
Um, so Logan Lucky in comparison wasn't for me as difficult as those were because if anything the scale was was much smaller but um, yeah when I when I look back and think about the first Oceans film I just think about how anxious I was. I mean there, obviously there are parallels uh, from a sort of narrative perspective but at the same time it's a completely different world I mean that was all tuxedos glitz and glamour and this is NASCAR and there's kind of obviously beauty pageants and it's it's the kind of it's a very different culture exploring is it kind of turning the American dream on its on its head as well what's the kind of idea behind this new kind of uh, looking into the high sort of genre, but from a completely different perspective. Well, what I liked about this screenplay was they don't start off as criminals. They have to sort of teach themselves how to do these jobs, and and um, that's a that's an inversion of an Ocean's movie where you have people who, when you parachute into the beginning of the film, are already established thieves. Um, Yes, I like the fact that, that they didn't have nice stuff. They didn't have any money. They don't have any technology. Um, they're, they're having to kind of take an analog approach to everything that they do. They've got to think laterally instead of vertically. Um, so it seemed very, while, while in, in, you know, a cousin to an Oceans film, at the same time it felt a little more grounded in reality. Um, there really, in the Oceans films, there really isn't the equivalent of the relationship that, that Jimmy Logan has with his daughter, for instance. And I really like that about the script as well. Um, so it, it, like I said, it seemed to, for me, satisfy both the, the, my my interest in the genre and 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 it was respectful of the kind of pillars that you have to have to make a heist movie work and yet it also seemed to be kind of using the the heist film genre as a vessel to kind of get into some other stuff as well some real life stuff that kind of leaks in to the movie from the side of the frame. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, as you sort of mentioned, there's this kind of fascinating study of American culture, but to a point where, do you think had this film been written post-Trump, it would have been a different sort of movie? Do you think that would have changed anything about the, the story or the characters or the world that they're kind of inhabiting? It's hard to say if the script were written now, um, whether, how you would approach it. You know, the script was written in 2014, and then we shot it in the late summer, fall of 2016. None of us, you know, could have anticipated where the, the country would be now. And luckily, the, the, script, the script wasn't political in the sense that what's implicit, I think, in the material is that for people like this, for people like Jimmy Logan and his friends, it doesn't matter who the president is. Nobody's helping them on either side, you know, and they never will. And they know that. And so there's this fatalistic attitude that goes beyond, you know, left or right or any of that stuff. They know that they're forgotten. And so that's why there wasn't really any need to, to, to be any more explicit about their situation. They're, they've, every generation of the family has been in this situation and every family, every generation going forward will. That's just the lot of these people. And of course, I mean, this is your fourth collaboration now, I think, with Channing Tatum, which suggests you guys have a very good working relationship. Is yeah. it fourth? Is that what? Yeah. Wait, let's. Project <laughs> Haywire. Side effects. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Like, I was, yeah, I was involved on Magic Mike XXL, so yeah. I feel like it's like four and a half. Yeah. Because I just, I was just wondering. I mean, what what it is then about him as as, as an actor that you keeps returning? He, he keeps returning into your projects. I mean, you must. I'm assuming you must be quite a big fan. Yeah, I mean, I think he has qualities that are difficult to fake. You know, there's a sort of sincerity there that I think is very genuine, and he he seems to typify what can be positive about being an American male. You know, he seems like the good version of that. Like a guy who has a sort of a code and a guy who has your back. And you know what I mean? That you can, that's loyal. Um, and, 
And that's true of him as a person, and I think that's what, why it comes across so strongly on the screen. And he's not a boy, you know, he's like a grown-up. And, and that's, that's not always the case, you know, with young actors who are being thrown into sort of lead roles. Um, and he's not, he's unpretentious, you know, you don't, you don't get the feeling that, that he's, um, you know, kind of making this all harder than it needs to be or taking it more seriously than it needs to be taken. Like Channing takes the work very seriously, but he's not somebody who walks around taking himself seriously in the way that would be off-putting. So I think, you know, he's, he's found, the reason he's had the success he's had is because there aren't a lot of other people who meet the descriptions that I just laid out. And he's fearless. That helps. Yeah, particularly in Magic Mike. And, um, I mean, when, when, when sort of thinking of casting uh, Joe Bang, what made you think, right, let's go for 007, Daniel Craig? Because, I mean, obviously, part of the kind of appeal to, 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 to him playing his character is that he's so sort of far removed from what he usually does. Was that what sort of attracted you to him? And why did you think of him in, in, in the first place? Because I guess when, I, when, when you would think of a character of this nature, he's not always the first person that would spring to mind. I guess it's because I knew him a little, and I knew, and if you know him even a little, you know that, that he's funny. And so it seemed like a really great opportunity for Daniel to show off, you know, uh, this, the, his comedic chops. You know, I, like, like you were saying, I don't think a lot of people would go to him first for something that was, you know, supposed to be comedic. And I knew he could do it. And um, I also had a sense of him that he was open to, to playing a character that would, that would really, you know, really be outrageous, like really be something that, that could potentially become in its own way uh, uh, another kind of iconic uh, performance in his in his gallery of performances, like it had that kind of potential for people to to walk up to him and say, "I loved you as Joe Bang," as often as they come up and say, "I love you as James Bond." Like it seemed to be sort of laying there if if he wanted to sort of fill it up, and he filled it up. I mean, because just to sort of change the pace somewhat. I mean, you you have obviously been quoted in the past as saying that you lost interest in in being direct in being a director. I was wondering, have you felt that your passion for the, for this craft from this particular um, um, angle, I guess, has been reignited off the back of, of Logan Lucky? Do you feel now that you've got that kind of favour back for, the, for for directing, or do you still feel a little disillusioned with with directing as a in cinema in Hollywood? Making the Nick really sort of got me re-energized in terms of directing. I think when I when I made all my big speeches and and declarations four years ago, I was I I had sort of combined, you know, or conflated my my frustration with the sort of traditional version of the movie business in the United States with directing. And when I got back on the set of The Nick, I realized, no, I actually like directing. I just don't like that version of the business. And so when the opportunity came up with Logan Lucky to approach the business from a different direction and kind of eliminate all the aspects of it that I didn't like, you know, being in the movies again suddenly seemed a lot more compelling than it did a few years back. So I'm hoping you know, that the Logan Lucky is is a sort of way for me to get back into making movies again. Well, I mean, you're in good company. I think Jay-Z did this song Encore and Retire, then about two years later he brought out another album, so it happens. Um, but, I mean, do you feel like a, a different filmmaker after this hi hiatus? Did you feel you came back with a different kind of perspective on the industry and, and the way you just approach sort of directing? Well, I think I'm a, yeah, I think I'm a different filmmaker than when I stopped making movies, and I think it's because of the work that I did in the interim. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's that's normal. I mean, I think if you don't if you don't feel different 
after you get out of any project, I think there's probably something wrong. I mean, I hope you would have learned something. Um, but there's no question that Logan Lucky benefited from the work that I'd done in the previous three years leading up to that shoot. You know, I feel like my, you know, filtering process um, was really amplified and, and accelerated by, by the work that I'd done in television on the Nick. You know, I was, I was, that was a real sort of full body workout making that show. And, and, you know, we were able to make Logan, I think in a shorter period of time, because I was confident that we could be really aggressive about the schedule. And in, in that sort of um, that break, uh, break away from directing in cinema, I mean, obviously Magic Mike XXL came out, which I absolutely adored. I mean, generally, are you quite open to to seeing films you you directed be direct, have sequels directed by somebody else, or are there any films that have, in your kind of back catalogue that you would be completely against ever seeing anyone else get their hands on? <laughs> well, Magic Mike XXL was kind of a special circumstance, and it was and it was something that when it was discussed. You know, I, I was very encouraging of Greg Jacobs directing that movie. I really felt, you know, his, his, his involvement in, in my entire career, but also in the first Magic Mike in particular, was so um, crucial that, that I, I just couldn't imagine my attitude is like, if Greg's not going to do it, it shouldn't get done, period. I've never been in a situation... I mean, look, Gary Ross is now directing Ocean's 8. I guess technically you could call that a sequel. Um, it's a little different because it was Gary's idea. Gary came to me with the idea and said, what do you think of this idea? And I said, I think that's a great idea. Um, and so I didn't have the kind of pro proprietary attitude that I might have towards something actually, that somebody was actually remaking that was mine. This was sort of, you know, uh, 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 existed in kind of a parallel universe. So I don't know. And I don't think they're, you know, I don't think anybody's running around wanting to remake the informant. I, you are obviously, I mean, just you're producing on Ocean Z. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, aside from the, the gender of the protagonist changing, how can we expect it to differ to to the original movies. Well, I'm not going to ruin that for you, but um, it is different. Ocean's Eight is different. I think primarily because of the the initial concept. Um, it's it's a really great feeling when you when you have on occasion, you know, a shot, a single shot with the entire cast in it. It's, it's really exciting. I think um, even more so because of, of what's happening in the States right now. Seeing, seeing, seeing a group of women get together and work together toward a common goal, regardless of the fact that it's to steal something, um, has taken on a kind of feeling that, that it, it didn't have even a year ago. It's just something, it's got something underneath it now that, that wasn't there before, that I think enhances it. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see soon enough. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice.